Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this really miserable rainy day. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Actually, I'm a tall person. Is that better? Uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the IRH and the CEH at the University of Wisconsin, my home institution, for helping me to be here. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the CHF staff, in particular that Wonder Woman, Tiff Beatty. Um, so what I'd like to do today is I have an hour, uh, and what I would like to do is to spend about a half an hour talking about my book, What Soldiers Do, and then I would like to open it up to questions, and there are many questions I'll raise in the talk to sort of get you thinking and, and contemplating. And then if we have any time at all, I would like to read you um, from this book, which I published after What Soldiers Do. It's a collection of memoirs of French people of D-Day and right after D-Day, the days after D-Day. Uh, and um, I'm somewhat missionary about these memoirs, so I'd love to be able to share at least one of them with you. Okay, so for, I also have to tell you that I'm gonna have to use some foul language in this talk. <laughs> uh, and so I can see there's no children here, that's good. Um, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. None of it is my fall talk, it's other people's fall talk. Among them, General Patton's fall talk. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so for a small-time academic like myself, the storm of controversy inspired by my book, What Soldiers Do, could not have come as a bigger surprise. In May of 1913, shortly after publication, I found myself talking to Robert Siegel on NPR and David Martin on NBC Sunday Morning. Uh, on May 20, Jenny Slusher did a glowing feature story on my book in the New York Times. You can imagine what that was like, you know, reading the New York Times my entire adult life and opening up a page to actually something about me. Uh, the same day, the exact same day, an email told me to shove that book up my ass sideways, okay? Uh, <laughs> Amazon reviewers began to appear, condemning me as a Nazi feminist, out to besmirch the greatest generation. I was called a prude, a spot of excrement, a whore, and here's the really, I'm just gonna prepare you for this one, an ugly lesbian Jewess who shills for niggers, okay? Oh. Rhetorically, that's incredibly efficient. Uh, <laughs> think about it. In those seven words, he got sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and racism. That's pretty amazing. And I would say class is in there, too. Okay, so you might wonder, what was this book about? Anyways, <laughs> what I wanted to do is to clarify my message uh, in the book and explain why I wrote it. Then I want to offer my explanation for the truly bipolar response I got in the social media and the press. And I think the story's worth exploring uh, because it tells us a great deal about what we think about sex. And in particular, what we think about sex and the military, okay? So that's on the agenda today. So first, what was I trying to do and what soldiers do? The project started when I fell upon a copy of a military newspaper called Stars and Stripes. Uh, and I'll just show you a picture here, the GI's reading it. Uh, this was read throughout the European theater and the wonderful history of Stars and Stripes is it moved with the soldiers. So it started in North Africa, then it went to Sicily, then Italy, then England, and finally Paris and ultimately Germany. That was where it was produced. Uh, and it's a wonderful paper to read. Uh, it's got edit, uh, cartoons, it's got sports. I had to call my father up and find out who the Browns were, the baseball team. Uh, and uh, uh, it also has editorial content that be can, can be categorized as propaganda. So I began to read the paper that summer and I slowly realized it was using sex to sell the GIs on the French campaign. Indeed, the GIs had grown up uh, hearing stories from their fathers who had fought in 1917 about uh, Paris and, and the gorgeous women and the sex and so on and so forth. Uh, and as a result, as one life journalist put it, 
quote, the general opinion all along the line was that France was a tremendous brothel inhabited by 40 million hedonists who spent all their time eating, drinking, and making love, unquote. And I think we still think of um, France as a sort of sexy country. I have this New Yorker cartoon on my office door, and it's a young boy and a father who are looking at this nude, and the father says to the son, well, don't worry you know, Junior, she's not naked, she's French, okay? <laughs> so I still think we have that notion of France as a particularly sexy country. But at the same time, the GIs felt no emotional attachment to the French and no real strong feeling for their freedom, okay? So uh, there was a problem in how to motivate the soldiers to fight. Many of the people uh, soldiers who came on, on shores on D-Day had already fought in Italy. They were tired, very battle-weary troops. So how are we going to motivate them? Because the French uh, were unknown to them, largely. So uh, what I realized is that what Stars and Stripes was doing was billing uh, the Normandy campaign as an erotic adventure. Okay? Uh, and uh, here is an example. So this is the kind of editorial. Uh, this is the kind of editorial stuff you get in Stars and Stripes, where you have a picture and then you have um, some text, and you can see here that they're defining the war aims as you know making French women beautiful, French women happy, right? Putting a smile uh, on. Uh, uh, on their faces. So in this way, I argued, I began to realize that what the Americans were doing was mapping onto Mer American war aims onto heterosexual relations, right? Uh, this was going to be a romance, uh, and the, the GI was going to land on the shore. He was going to be uh, the, the rescuer, and the damsel in distress was going to get liberated. This is how they were selling it to me. And what also, just why I have this up, if you look at this closely, it's pretty clear that this is a touched up photo. Um, and so uh, it was interesting to me in particular because it looks like it's been crafted to look like a, a, a group of, of um, adoring uh, women. Uh, so uh, to me, it makes the propaganda effort even more of a creation. Now, the liberation of Paris in particular was erotically charged. According to one infantryman interviewed by Stars and Stripes, the Parisienne, quote, wait at street intersections for a jeep to pause. That's the signal for all hell to break loose, and the kissing starts. If this is war, I love it, said the infantryman. Uh, another photo, this is how the liberation was uh, reported. Uh, the caption here is Save Jitterbug, Mademoiselle, uh, and it featured a GI dancing with a French woman uh, surrounded uh, by a crowd. Also promising, uh, so, and also you may not speak French and they don't Save English, but Corporal Rosario Taliente of Brooklyn demonstrates there's a universal language as he teaches French. Uh, cutie to jitterbug and streets of the liberated city. So you get the idea. Uh, here's a cartoon, and Hubert was a very common cartoon. This is a really complicated cartoon, uh, and I'd like to say more about it than I can, but you can see this was the common thing. The jeep stops, the kissing starts. Uh, but what's really interesting to me about this cartoon is that the man here, the French man on the right, uh, he was probably a member of the resistance because he's armed. He, um, he not only looks very feminized, uh, but he's making a kind of uh, move for the driver and he's not looking happy about it, so there's a sort of homoerotic thing going on. Actually, the historical background of that is that the cond every GR got three condoms a month, uh, and for those who weren't using them for the usual purposes, they would put them on their guns to keep their guns clean. 
Okay, so you're beginning to see uh, how erotic, uh, but my favorite thing in terms of this category of eroticization of the Normandy campaign was the language, the phrases. So in the Stars and Stripes, usually at the top of the banner, there would be phrases in either German or French. So supposedly the GIs could learn important phrases to communicate with the civilian population. So the difference between what was considered essential German and what was considered essential French is very revealing, okay? So the German phrases that were considered essential were keine Zigaretten, no cigarettes, Waffen niederlagen, throw down your arms, Antreten, forwards, line up, forward. By contrast, crucial French phrases included, vous êtes très jolie, <laughs> you are very pretty, vous avez les yeux charmants, you have charming eyes. Uh, moi, je suis un général. <laughs> <laughs> I am a general. And my personal favorite, vos parents sont-ils chez eux? Are your parents at home? <laughs> <laughs> So the framing of the war as an erotic adventure turned out to be only one way in which sex was central to how the, the war was fought and won. Now, it's important for you to realize here that the sexual habits of American soldiers have been largely dismissed by military historians, either as natural boys will be boys behavior or as a form of recreation. Uh, just to take one example, Stephen Ambrose uh, makes only passing references to prostitutes or girls in France uh, and how they provided entertainment for easy country. Uh, easy company, excuse me, and other soldiers. But I was finding, in fact, that far from being mere boyish fun and games, and of course it was mere boyish fun and games, I, I agree, but GI sex and its management became a subtle but vital transfer of power for the growth of American dominance in the European theater. Sexual fantasies about France did indeed motivate the GIs to get off the boat and fight. But such fantasies, much to the dismay of the army, also unleashed what I call a veritable tsunami of lust on the part of American soldiers. Uh, by uh, six weeks after uh, the invasion, venereal disease was skyrocketing among uh, the GIs. Uh, several, uh, even generals, had tried to start their own brothels in France. Uh, and uh, by fall, uh, General Eisenhower was receiving from his staff a Norman press editorial uh, accusing the Americans of widespread rape. As the paper claimed, Norman women were afraid to go out at night, quote, there is terror in the streets and even the security of the home is imperiled. Now, I was not the first person to know that sexual promiscuity and sexual violence were present in the Normandy campaign, but I do seem to be the first historian to take note of this fact, hence uh, I suddenly find myself on NPR's Fresh Air. Now, I attribute this approach uh, to two things I did as an historian, which I don't think anyone else has done. The first, unlike the majority of historians writing on Normandy, I looked at French as well as American sources, okay? Uh, and a lot of this is a language issue, right? That, uh, you know, American historians, military historians don't speak French, they don't speak German, they don't speak the languages where local archives can give them a fresh view of the American GIs in that particular country or theater. Uh, so um, I was trained as a French historian, not an American historian, and so I quickly went to not just uh, French archives, but local, local French archives, uh, municipal archives in towns such as Le Havre and Rennes, where uh, the American GIs had large bases. Okay, and uh, the other reason no one's looked at those documents is according to the French government, all documents, particularly documents on prostitution, have to be frozen for 60 years. Uh, so if you do the math, uh, January 1st, 2005, uh, was the first day that anyone could look at these, and I was literally waiting outside, okay, <laughs> the door. Uh, so, um, 
I sit down in this tiny little town in uh, Le Havre, and I'm looking at the archives on the long wooden desk in this small room, and I just couldn't believe what I was reading, frankly. Uh, spread in front of me were a collection of letters, and I'll show you one of them. Um, written by citizens of this Norman port town to their mayor in the summer of 1945. Uh, and I know you can't read that. I'll quote from it in a minute. The subject concerned thousands of GIs who were posted in the, uh, particularly about a million and a half GIs went in through and through that town, either on the way to war or on the way back to town, back from the war. Uh, and in the summer of 1945, they were waiting to get on a boat. And that was really the time of troubles because the war had been won and uh, discipline was, um, discipline was low. Uh, this uh, particular person uh, wrote to the mayor of La Havre, Pierre Voisin, and he said, attacked, robbed, run over both on the street and in our houses. This is a regime of terror imposed by bandits in uniform. And you might notice that word terror keeps coming up, and I actually addressed that uh, in my chapter on rape. What is it about terror, uh, that, that word? Uh, I also read the newspapers, local newspapers of La Havre, and the pol police blotter was literally full of crimes GIs committed. There were an enormous amount of Jeep accidents, for example, with GIs driving their, you know, their vehicles too fast down these windy uh, European roads and oftentimes killing uh, people and injuring people. Uh, there were also break-ins, there were thefts, uh, there were assaults, there were fights, and there were rapes, okay? So from one end of the town to another, the GIs, remember, who have guns and fists and bad memories of the war, uh, tried to get what they wanted, whether it was cognac, money, or women. Um, and then that was not alone, unfortunately. I also looked at St. Lo, I looked at Cherbourg, I looked at Rennes, all other places, and Paris as well, of course. And I saw that violence uh, was an American problem wherever they went. And it is true that uh, in Normandy, there was much more of an American presence than a Canadian or British presence. But in Paris, there was equal amounts of presence of all troops. And still the Americans took the prize for crime. So, uh, so this is the first thing I did that I think revealed another side that hadn't been seen before uh, and allowed me to look at D-Day from a completely different perspective, a side of what I call the national frame. We often think about, you know, the first thing I do in my World War II class is I show the students Saving Private Ryan. And the first image in that film, which I love, of course, is the American flag. So uh, we've learned to understand Normandy within a national frame. But in fact, this was a world war. Uh, and the historian Carol Gluck uh, once said, you know, we need to put the world back in world war, OK? So what I'm trying to do is look at war in a much more trans transnational perspective, get outside of that national frame, because it's inevitably skewed in as much as gover governments uh, really require huge amounts of its citizens during the war, even giving their lives. And so writing within that frame, the history inevitably distorts it. The second thing I did, uh, which no one else has done, is I took sex seriously as a form of power, OK? Uh, you know, and it's difficult for us to remember this, but during 1944-45, uh, France was in a very precarious position in terms of her sovereignty as a nation. Uh, the, French, uh, uh, the French leader, Charles de Gaulle, was not in any way recognized uh, uh, before the invasion as the leader of the French. He was told only at the last minute about the invasion, and his government, uh, which literally took power illegally but successfully, was not recognized by the American government until October of 1944. So uh, we're talking about uh, the GI's uh, occupation of a country whose sovereignty was very much in question. So issues of power were very important. And in particular, I think the ambiguity of the power situation, with France being sort of both an enemy and an ally, uh, made sexual issues even more charged with politics. Um, and at several different levels, I think, as a result, um, 
prostitution was not business as usual, was not boys will be boys behavior. Instead, it produced what I call radical asymmetries in power, where somebody gets a lot, another person doesn't get much. Uh, at several different levels, so I'm gonna just deal with two today. At the most intimate level, body and body in a room, prostitution, the prostitute taught GI dominance by submitting her own body for his pleasure. Prostitution is about money and power. A soldier paid a woman to subjugate her body for his personal pleasure, right? That's a, that's a very, uh, very intimate kind of power, I think. And from that privileged relationship, a GI was taught not only to use a French woman for his own ends, but also to exert control over French civilians in general. Sex is a commodity nurtured in arrogant, I would say even an imperialist attitude among the Americans who bought it. And the fact is that the GIs came across more prostitutes than any other type of French civilian, okay? And so it made that very intimate relationship much more political, much more powerful as a result. I can only give you one example. Uh, in his diary of, September 1944, Chester Hansen, who was the military aide to Omar Bradley, noted the aggressive prostitutes in Paris. When he danced with one, she stunned him by saying, you will sleep with me tonight, no? From this encounter, he concluded, and I quote, it to his diary, he wrote to his diary, French people have sold themselves to no one and no one is impressed by them. So here what Hansen does is conflate a sexual proposition with a broader bid for national recognition. Uh, similarly connected in his mind was his rejection of the prostitute and his rejection or his disdain uh, for the French generally. So in this way, I think the prostitute serves not just as a symbol of the nation, but in some ways a broker uh, for Franco-American relations. Um, and paying female civilians to have sex taught millions of GIs to expect subservience from the French. So that's the most intimate level, at the most broad political, geopolitical level. The bitter conflicts that arose between the US Army and the French government anchored larger struggles for power. In particular, authorities clashed over the problem of the venereal disease. Uh, and I have to say, in this case, French women were always the infectors. Okay, even when I could see them talking about a French prostitute getting infected and then becoming infected, uh, that step was always skipped over. They were always already infectors, okay? So they were blamed for the soaring rates of venereal disease, and the uh, men were not accountable. And at the heart of the quarrel was discretion. Uh, soon after D-Day, military officers realized that they could not control GI uh, sex, sexual activity in France. And my, my, favorite, uh, my favorite phrase on this is one of the lieutenants says, the sex act cannot be made unpopular, okay? <laughs> uh, and so what they, they didn't really know what to do because they needed sex to be medically safe, but they could not in any way institutionalize sexual labor because that would uh, bring it forth as a visible reality to the American press and it would get home to the American public. So they had to keep it deinstitutionalized. They had to keep it casual, but they had to somehow keep it medically safe, hence giving out three condoms uh, a month. It was completely, absolutely forbidden, um, but yet they gave out condoms. Uh, so as a result, in base cities like Le Havre, Rhin, Cherbourg, uh, uh, sex between GIs and prostitutes was taking place everywhere. It was taking place in abandoned buildings. It was taking place in cemeteries. It was taking place in parks. Uh, and so, in fact, we got more letters like this one uh, complaining that the citizens of Le Havre could not visit their mother's grave or take a walk uh, without seeing a GI engaged in sex with a prostitute. Uh, this is what the mayor called scenes contrary to decency. Uh, and it was taking place day and night, even in front of children, according to the mayor. 
Uh, and at night was worse. This is, uh, you know, when the soldiers would go out and they would be drunk. There was so much drinking going on. Uh, and they would look for sex and they would knock on doors. Respectable women, quote unquote, could not go out. And even again, as the newspapers said, uh, the, the security of the home uh, was not sacred. So uh, in this way, the sex that had to remain hidden to the American public remained a rudely visible reality for the French. If GIs were having sex wherever they pleased, that was because the inhabitants of La Havre, as respectable members of community and as citizens of a nation, had become invisible to them. At bottom, I argue the sexual exploitation of French women during these years was about American arrogance and the exercise the sheer exercise of power. U.S. military officers shifted responsibility for venereal infection onto France and French women itself, uh, which was already, France was already fixed in their minds, obviously, as a debauched, immoral country. Hence, we can have sex wherever we want. Uh, and uh, this shift, I think, both justified their control over French women's bodies. They began to control uh, the female population, where it was, what it was doing. And it also, I think, allowed them not to take accountability for the GI's actions. Now, the last issue is rape. And here, accountability for the just use of power is at, I think, uh, its most crucial. There was a rape wave uh, in late summer 1944. Army statistics revealed that in August, the number of rape accusations brought forth by Norman women jumped 300% over the previous month. And this is now known as a rape wave. I do want to qualify that by saying, first of all, I, I'll give you some statistics in a minute, but rape statistics are uh, for very complicated and well-known reasons, uh, almost useless. But I do want to qualify that the rapes that were going on in Normandy were nowhere near, we're talking in the hundreds, uh, to what would happen in the Ukraine in 1941 and what was going to happen, uh, or what had actually happened in Berlin in 1945. So uh, just a, a note to qualify uh, the dimensions of this crisis. Now, uh, in the delicate ecosystem that was Franco-American uh, relations, sexual violence acted as a highly destructive force uh, that gave the lie, first of all, to the Stars and Stripes notion of the GI as a very uh, a princely rescuer, right? Uh, the specter of sexual assault transformed the Americans from a liberating people to an imperial power that exploited the traditional prerogatives of conquest. Equally important, the allegations suggested that the Americans had neither the will nor the power to establish law and order in the lands they conquer. And in that uh, article I keep referring to, it referred to the American government as impotent, uh, which is never a word you want to hear associated with the American government. Uh, so, uh, so basically, officers had to then confront the excesses which they had in a way begun by creating the Norman invasion as a fantasy, as a sexual fantasy. Uh, but what it did, I think, out of arrogance and also cowardice was rather than take accountability for the entire U.S. Army, what the American officials did was to blame it on African Americans. So that rape became a black crime, not an American crime. And I literally show in the book, you know, when exactly, I literally like was able to pinpoint the moment when this happened in the documents that I looked at at the National Archives and Schaaf article. So within the year, 25 black soldiers had been summarily tried and executed on French soil, hanged by rope. And in the, land, in the land of the guillotine, it was hard to find a hangman, so the U.S. Army actually brought in a hangman from Texas to do the job. According to Judge Advocate General reports, during these years, soldiers, 181 soldiers were charged with raping French women and court-martialed. 139 of those were African American, about 77 percent, despite the fact that less than 10 percent of the forces, American soldiers in the ETO, were black. 
and I go into this in great detail. There were 151 death sentences imposed for the crime of rape, and 65% of them were black. So there are more black people not only guilt, found guilty, but also actually executed for the crime. Now, I think in the act of rape, we can see most clearly how sex operates as a form of power, as a form of dominance uh, and aggression. It was the most common crime in the Second World War, and yet it has been largely passed over by military historians as a fact of war. When books like mine appear, and I think this is part of the negative uh, response I got, we are shocked at its prevalence, even in Normandy, right? even by the Americans. No, it couldn't have happened to the Americans. No, or maybe the Russians, maybe the Germans, but not the Americans. So I, I want to end here by asking that question. Why is that? You know, why do we feel shock about that? Rape silence, I think, in the historical record comes, at least in part, but what I believe is, and I would love to hear your thoughts about this, an unwritten but very powerful prerogative of war for those who fight it. And the prerogative goes something like this. Men in battle have an extraordinary need for sex and feel entitled to get it. Patton had a pithy way of saying it. Here we go. If they don't fuck, they don't fight, okay? <laughs> One reader of my book wrote to tell me of a promise Patton had given to his father's unit when he served in the Third Army. When they got to Germany, Patton assured him, they were going to fuck every goddamn Fraulein. Somehow a soldier's prerogative or entitlement to sex has passed from generation to generation. I think it is one of these things that's uh, truly ahistorical. Right? I, we don't know really what its origins are. Uh, and uh, most recently, we've seen it in Bosnia, just to take one example. Uh, military historians have been complicit about rape, both in their silence, but also in their dismissal of sex as a marginal recreation. Stephen Ambrose writes in Band of Brothers, for example, that the boys of Easy Company sought women when they, quote, needed a physical outlet for their energy, considering their extraordinary needs of battle. You know, so Ambrose is in on this prerogative. It goes unquestioned in his book. And so we return uh, where we began uh, to the controversies surrounding my book. Uh, a Korean veteran wrote me the following, and I think this is, I thought this was so interesting. I've given this so much thought. I'd love to know what you think about it. When you have survived living what might be the last day of your life, then you can question the morality of soldiers. So in this man's mind, I was a woman who had no right to judge even though I wasn't judging, uh, those who experienced the war firsthand. For him, sex was an erotic release, a just payment for combat sacrifice, and a reward for survival. But it was not an instrument of domination. So herein lies my explanation for my book's controversy. We have trouble understanding sex as a form of power, of dominance, of aggression. My purpose in writing what soldiers do was not to criticize the moral failings of the greatest generation, uh, nor to hold them to any standard higher of behavior. My own parents, my beloved parents, were both in the greatest generation. I, I would never hold my father higher to any standard of behavior. <laughs> and he was one of my favorite people ever. Uh, so I have great attachments to the greatest generation. But rather, I wanted to open our eyes to the ways in which sex operates as a central power relation in modern warfare, even though it has been ignored largely by military historians. But for the popular readership of my book, that point you know, that sex is about power seems to have gone missing. With my argument about sex and power, stripped away, I come across as a prude, as I was called, uh, denying sexual pleasure to soldiers, right? That's what they think this is about. Likewise, what soldiers do becomes, and I quote, an extended and often repeated whine about the behavior of the American GIs. So to conclude, the dismissal of the sexual shenanigans of soldiers as an inevitable element of war is unacceptable to me, both as an historian and as a feminist. As an historian, I seek to understand past events as products of circumstance rather than the inevitable results of unspoken rules or biological needs. 
i.e. the exceptional need of men in warfare. And as a feminist, I view such an approach as coming too close to excusing the sexual violence such naturalized erotic desire might produce. I'm dedicated to writing new histories of the Second World War, which take sexual relations seriously as a form of dominance, and which chart the American rise to global power as happening in the bedroom, as well as the planning room, the brothel, as well as the battlefield. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can please raise your hand and we will come around with a microphone. Studying this history, what do you think the consequence of having more women on the military field will be? Uh, okay, so the question, sorry, I'll go here. The question was, what difference does it make that women are going to be in the military now? Yeah, I think it's going to make a huge difference. I really do. Um, and uh, I think the Army is beginning to realize that. Uh, and the reason I say that is I'm, I'm, I'm going to West Point next week to talk to 600 freshman cadets. So, <laughs> and specifically about my book, and specifically it was mentioned to me that they, now that there are 30% women in the class, they feel they need to. So I think change is happening. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, hi, thank you for coming, and it's, I've got the book, and it's a great book, it's a good read, and I was opened up to the fact that uh, I didn't understand why the French didn't like us when I went through France, and I think I know because of your book, we bombed the hell out of their country, and sometimes not necessary, but uh, a fellow at my church uh, said he actually saw people having sex on the yard, front yard of a church, but uh, I was in Germany for two years in the army, and a lot of the guys would go to Amsterdam, and I don't think they were going there to prove dominance. They just wanted to get laid. <laughs> yeah, I, do, I think that's just a lot of complicated issues. I'm not sure I can answer any of them in the time. And, and I do recognize that sex is a form of recreation. I'm not saying it's just a form of dominance. I think more in its effects than in its causes. It it's, can be uh, perceived and felt as a form of aggression and dominance uh, by a prostitute, and it also can be perceived uh, and uh, impacted as a form of power in how it's managed by states. Hi, I'm just wondering um, what leads you to assume, at least the impression you gave me when you were talking is that um, it, with sex as a form of power and dominance, it was always the, the man that was exercising it as opposed to the woman. Um, well, in this case, I'm only, I, I can never talk in universals, but in this case, we're talking about um, uh, soldiers from a country which is uh, invaded and occupied a country that they're incredibly well supplied, right? Um, and uh, they're marching on their way, uh, have, you know, really in, in victoriously after really August 1944. And the women who are very poor, I did a lot of work on the women who actually were prostitutes. Uh, they were doing it because most of them were doing it in, in the police archives, what they told the police, because they had nothing else to make a living. Uh, and there was widespread starvation in France um, throughout that summer and fall. So they were in a rather desperate situation. So in this case, I think it's truly uh, an asymmetry of power be between the soldier and the woman. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to read your book. I was surprised by your last comment mm -hmm. uh, because it seems to overlook the fact that this was not the U.S. going into Germany, a defeated country. This was U.S. Mm -hmm. liberating France. Right. Um, and so I'm wondering about that. But also, you use the stars and stripes as your message that uh, the American military was teaching men that the reason to go into France was for sex. Mm -hmm. Did you look at archives? Did you look at what the soldiers were being told? Mm -hmm. um, because this is only one small element. 
Yeah, no, I, that's a really fair question, the Stars and Stripes question. Yeah, of course, I looked at memoirs, uh, letters home, you know, and, uh, but what I was really interested in here uh, was Stars and Stripes because it, it was only one element, but it was the main, um, it was the main organ of propaganda for the soldiers. Uh, it was widely read in the trenches. Uh, it was widely read in England. Uh, so, um, so that that was the, the main one. But I also looked at the thing you have to realize is that there was no document where you know Shafe got together and said, "Hey, let's sell." you know, hey, let's sell the, the Normandy campaign on sex. That, you know, that would be my dream document, but it wasn't gonna happen. Uh, the fact is that Stars and Stripes was semi-independent, but it was also feeding what the GIs uh, were supposed, to, they thought would, would be receptive to. So I, I felt pretty comfortable privileging it as a source, both because of the breadth of, of readership that it had, and also that it was uh, from, uh, the War Department, right, which was creating, there was also lots of other propaganda, uh, but uh, the other thing I looked at uh, very carefully was the um, uh, manual which the American Army gave to GIs to um, have them deal with the French. For every uh, country where the US soldiers deal with, they get a manual on the customs and culture of that country, and it was identical. Uh, you know, you know, you probably think French girls are easy, but they're not, and so on and so forth. So there was, um, in both that manual and the Stars and Stripes, there was a real matchup of the propaganda message. So, um, and both of them were read by every GI. Um, hi, in the news uh, lately has been um, news about the Japanese being um, accused of uh, and from the, by the Koreans and the Chinese of organized rape as power. Uh, could you comment on that? Because it, that was organized governmental, I think, and not exactly the same as what you've been talking about. Okay, so uh, that's a completely different order of things, I think, because um, those women were not paid for their sexual labors. Many of them were abducted from their home in Korea and brought to places where the Japanese were fighting. Um, so they are what I would call sexual slaves, whereas what the GIs were doing was much, much more within a framework of uh, consent. You know, these were desperate women, but they could choose to go or not choose to go, and they were not brought to another place. So I think it's very different. I know you said you were going to speak at West Point and that with 30% things are changing but we still hear a lot about assault in the military amongst the soldiers, male and female. Um, can you speak on that? Yeah. Um, well, one of the reasons, one of the reasons my book made a splash was it came out the same uh, week as a um, survey of sexual harassment in the army, uh, which caused a scandal. Uh, and uh, the results of the survey were interesting because uh, it made it clear that if you were a woman, you had a far higher, um, you had a far higher percentage chance of being raped uh, than if you were a man. But what was interesting to me, and again, silence was completely um, absolute about this, is that 53% of the victims were men on men rape. Uh, and uh, that was just not talked about at all. So, um, so I think it's really complicated. Um, I think if you're a woman in the military, yes, you still, and again, I think people are trying to work on this, but I think change comes really slowly. But I think what's really interesting there is that homosexual rape is obviously a huge part of the picture and no one's talking about it at all. Um, just wanted to say I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, one of the things that really strikes me is you are disrupting sort of uh, our national narrative about the Second World War, and I could see how that could cause just a um, really strong reaction. Um, I guess the question is, is about narrative, you know, um, our national narratives around, especially around wars, um, in terms of how, how are they developed um, 
and then how do they almost turn into mythologies, especially around the moniker of the greatest generation? Why World War II? What about World War One? You know, the, the same sort of effect where Americans went over to France to liberate um, the, you know, the, the French from the German invasion. Um, why World War II? Well, that's a huge question. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, I think that's, that the history of um, popular views of World War II should be written. Um, I think that uh, 1984, which was the 50th anniversary of D-Day, was a particular moment in our history. Um, it wasn't just an anniversary. Um, I think also uh, it had to do with Tom Brokaw and Steven Spielberg, all these amazing, uh, truly powerful um, movies and books that came out. And then I also think it was followed quite rapidly by the Persian Gulf War. And I think that as America engaged in wars that were considered um, controversial and ambiguous in their aims, I think that put more pressure on the Second World War to be the good war. So I actually don't think it's just about innocent memory. I also think it has to do with American foreign policy and Americans' conduct and world affairs. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that, but that's a great question. Okay, Can we still we have it? time just to read a little memoir uh, in What Soldiers Do? We have five more minutes. That's correct, go ahead. Oh, okay, great. All right, so again, I this is the second book that I've written, and um, and before I start, I, there is one more thing I want to say, is that um, I can't emphasize enough how much I uh, admire what we did in Normandy. Uh, and uh, to me, uh, to write a book like I did in no way diminishes the glory of June 6, 1944. Uh, it was an amazing moment on our history. It was an heroic moment, uh, and 3,000 men died that day. Uh, that's a terrible legacy. And again, as I said, my own father was in, a veteran of the war, so uh, I have a lot of respect, but I also feel uh, that uh, we can't look at these people uh, as angels and as imperfect. Um, that's an historian's uh, purpose, really, is to create a more complex narrative, um, and that's all I'm trying to do, okay. All right, so I just wanna read you one, maybe two um, of these memoirs, uh, and the first one has to do with the night of all nights, as I call it, uh, which is what would be like, the, the book basically says what would it be like, you know, we always have that Robert Kappa shot, right, uh, where he's, he's taking pictures of the, the soldiers going on the beach. So I challenge my reader to be the French people on the shore, uh, and what was it like for them to see the soldiers coming towards them, okay? So uh, the first memoir I'm gonna read ha happened the night before the invasion when um, paratroopers dropped into Normandy to begin reconnaissance and to create runways so that gliders and other equipment by air could come in. So in the middle of the night, Americans started to drop into Normandy. Okay, imagine the cold courage of these. And this was, of course, the 82nd and the 101st Airborne. In the month of June, the days no longer have an end, and the night is really just a long twilight because the darkness is never complete. Around 10 p.m. this Monday, the 5th of June, I have just gone to bed next to my mother. We were both sleeping on a day bed that we opened up every night in the common room. Since the evacuation of Cherbourg, we have given our bedroom to my grandparents. The day bed faces the window itself, uh, wide open for the night. In this way, from my bed, I am taking a moment to reflect on the end of this beautiful day. With sadness, I think of a similar June night in 1940 when my boyfriend, Jean, had left to join the Free French. I had received news that he had landed in North Africa, so perhaps he was now in Italy. Perhaps, perhaps it will be soon, I thought, but then refused to let my mind wander further. It was time to go to sleep. Abruptly, the noise of airplanes breaks the night's silence. We have gotten used to that sound. Since there are no military targets here and the railway is more than five miles away, we normally do not pay much attention. 
but the noise gets louder and the sky begins to light up and get red. I rise out of bed and soon the whole family is up as well. We go out into the courtyard. There everything seems calm. The only thing you can hear is the distant murmur of a bombardment in the direction of Quinneville. Yet there seems to be an endless number of planes mysteriously roaming about. Their engines create an incessant hum. Then the noise decreases and becomes vague and distant. It's just like the last time, said my mother, when they had to bomb the blockhouse on the coast. And we all go back to bed. Mama goes to sleep right away, but I sit on my bed and continue to study the rectangle of cloudless night carved out by the window. The need to sleep slowly overwhelms me, but my eyes remain wide open. It's in this sort of half-sleep that I begin to see fantastic shadows, somber shapes against the clear blackness of the sky, like big black umbrellas. They rain down on the fields across the way and then disappear behind the black line of the hedges. No, I am not dreaming. Grandma was also not sleeping and saw them from the window of the bedroom. I wake up Mama and my aunt. We hurriedly get dressed and go out into the courtyard. Once again, the sky is filled with a continuous, ever intensifying hum. The hedgerows are alive with a strange crackling sound. That, of course, was the crickets that the GIs were told to use. Monsieur Dumont, the neighbor across the street, a widow who lives with his three children, has also come out of the house. He comes towards us and shows me, hanging on the edge of the roof courtyard, a parachute. The Dumont kids follow their fathers and join us in the schoolyard, but the night has not yet revealed its secret. An impatient curiosity is stronger than the fear that grips me. I leave the courtyard and make my way onto the road. At the fence of a neighboring field, a man is sitting on the edge of the embankment. He is harnessed with big bags and armed from head to foot, rifle, pistol, some sort of knife. He makes a sign for me to approach him. In English, I ask him if his plane was shot down. He negates that, and in a low voice, asks and says, it's the big invasion. Thousands and thousands of paratroopers are landing in the countryside tonight. Thank you. <laughs>